Finalists, conference attendees, and honored guests, welcome to the 56th Annual Nebula Awards. I'm the president of Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, Mary Robinette Kowal, and in physical space, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the traditional homelands of indigenous peoples. There were at least eight tribes in what is now Tennessee during the time of European colonization. Those indigenous peoples are the Muscogee Band of Creek, Muchi, Chickasaw, Chickamauga Band of Cherokee, Choctaw, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Shawnee, and Seneca. By the 18th century, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians were likely the only native people living permanently in Tennessee, and they were forcibly removed by European settlers. I invite us all to take a moment to consider whose lands your corporeal form sits in. I am also speaking to you once again from the Airship Nebula, SIFWA's shared space for this conference. And in case you can't tell that this show is live, I've just managed to close my script. This is going to be very exciting for all of us. The airship launched last year as part of the way that we were handling a global pandemic and many different things that were upsetting the world. This has become a place of sharing and consideration. It's become a place where the people who create science fiction and fantasy have been in, uh, given the power to communicate with each other and to begin to sh create new shared worlds. Tonight, we're going to be celebrating those people, the ones who create the worlds that have sustained us for the past year. And to do that, we have our host, Adria Walden, and Welcome to the 2021 Nebula Awards. Last year, it was my privilege to join you on the inaugural voyage of the Airship Nebula, and I'm excited to report that now we have docked with some kind of mysterious habitat. Was it built by aliens? Is it magic from another dimension? Every time I look at it, it's different, and I, I think it's changing parts of the airship too. Could it be sending us some kind of message? Is it alive? Huh, yeah, that's not, that's not worrying. Actually, what is a little worrying is that Cuddles is sort of missing. See, it turns out that if you've been stuck in a space pod for ages, when you land on an exciting new habitat and leave the pod bay door open, Adria, the space dragon who's been cooped up inside with you might run off and never come back. Well, not never. I mean, I hope not. But the show must go on. I hosted on my own last year, and I can do it again. Take that, toxic positivity. It really is so good to see you all. A year is a long time, even when you haven't been on a scouting pod looking for a place where you can live and go outside and see each other in person again. It's been a journey, a journey that I would like to tell you about in song. I've been alone, totally solo. I didn't know. How I would fare Away from my friends Away from my family Wondering What's going on Out there But then I had a spark A realization While floating here All by myself I'm actually in the best of company because you're on my shelf. I've been transformed to someone new and it's all because of you. I missed human connection. I wanted that a lot. So I processed all that lingered. Then I found a squirrel and fox. It was hard being patient. My only snuggles were in dreams. Like waiting 40 years to learn your four profound weaves. 
My days became all blurry, trapped inside this cage. Then I found the riot baby, someone to share my rage. I thought about my stepsister and had a dark vision that we were both locked up in a shifting shadow prison. I've been transformed to someone new and it's all because of you. I didn't know where the future would lead. I felt just like a working breed. Politics broke me, brought me to my knees. So I turned to let's away for justice seeking. I missed all the ways I used to motor all around. Buses and route zeros and the Luminas underground. I prayed this isolation was an accidental error. I needed my own guide, just like my spirit fairer. I sent thousands of texts to friends one and all. Their answers all redacted, like the rules of blaze ball. I went down to Hades to fight through the abyss. Then I came up for a breath of sense and semiosis. I've been transformed to someone new. And it's all because of you. I made funny vids, never sure whether I'd find true connection like Ray Bearer. My cake attempt left my tummy aching till I opened a wizard's guide to defensive baking. I felt weird about not even trying to dress my bottom half. But I have two truths and a lie to distract me from that. I tried being super, even thought about a pill. You kept me occupied. I'm so obsessed with your skill. I tried to keep a smile despite all that I saw. I tried staying hopeful in my tower of mud and straw if I could just keep going and somehow not freak out I could do the impossible just like the girls in ring shout I've been transformed to someone new and it's all because of you and look, I admit it, my Instagram rants, they went far too far. So I summoned my resolve like the daughter of a star. When hope was waning and I only had doubts, I'd revisit that haunted open house. I knew that I could make it, that this wouldn't be goodbye. Cause if those badass moms could do it, well then darn it, so could I. When everything was too much and I yearned for a new path, I got out my abacus and I worked that portal math. I knew that I could make it because they did an ifioku. Once I got a grip on zooming, I knew that I'd pull through and stand up to midnight bargains even under a black sun. Like a network effect, there'd be some drastic action. I've been transformed to someone new. And it's all because of you. My home haircut, sad but triumphant, cause I found my own ghost for comfort. Time to undock and coast out yonder. This strip is my 8000 Getting back to normal will be fun and weird and messy. Exiting this labyrinth like we're all a Piranesi. When this is past us and when this journey's done, I'm fascinated to see what city we've become. Some things will change, but friends, we've totally got this. We'll sort out this new mystery like a true Mexican Gothic, and soon we'll be together.
all toasting Nabula and having wild adventures like they did in Finna. Thank you all for joining me and for being my light. I thought your words would comfort me, and guess what? I was right. Congrats to all, it's gonna be a great night And it's all because, it's all because, it's all because Yes, it's all because of you Thank you to all of you, our finalists, the members of SIFWA, and to everyone watching whose creativity has helped to make this past year a little brighter. We could not have made it without you. And now let's begin tonight's 2021 Nebula Awards ceremony. Our first presenter is a Nebula-nominated writer and tireless advocate for authors and for SIFWA. Airship passengers and honored guests, please welcome Tobias Bakel. Hi, Tobias Buckel here, Vice President of CIFWA, and it is my honor to present Nella Hopkinson with the 37th Damon Knight Grandmaster Award for her contributions to our field. As an award winner, Nalo has won the British Fantasy Award for Best Anthology for People of Color Destroy Science Fiction, the Andre Norton Award for Sister Mine, her novel, the Sunburst Award for her book New Moon's Arms and her collection Skin Folk, the Pre Aurora Award for novel New Moon's Arms, the Inkpot Award for Achievements in Science Fiction, the Galactic Spectrum Award for her novel The Salt Roads, the World Fantasy Award for her collection Skin Folk, and the Locus Award for her novel Brown Girl in the Ring. She's also been shortlisted for the Campbell Memorial Award, the Nebula Award multiple times, Times, the Mythiopeic Award, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Black Writers, Cuba's Casa de las Americas Prize, the Philip K. Dick Award for our two novels, the James R. Tiptree Award for a short story and a novel, and the Hugo Award. And her accolades also include honors like being chosen for whole community read-alongs, many reprints in years, best anthologies, reprints in textbooks, and her literature is taught in classrooms across the globe and are perennially rediscovered by readers of every generation. Nalo is a pathmaker, uh, breaking into the science fiction field with a clear Caribbean voice and background, and she showed the way for many other Caribbean writers. Uh, it's hard and sometimes lonely to be the first on the ground somewhere, and her bravery and hard work created an entire space for whole new generations of island authors to enter into our field, and that is one of the things we honor today. But as you can see from her numerous award wins and nominations, Nalo has had an impact on science fiction and fantasy far further than just the Caribbean writers uh, that people often talk about. She's been a voice of uh, an, an inspiration for LGBTQ voices and literature in our field. She's a voice for people of color throughout the world, and she's a beacon for immigrants from all over the world who turn to our literature to make sense of their own experiences of crossing cultures. I personally cannot imagine how many people, both as a brilliant writer and as a path-making author, that Nalo has affected with her words and with her presence in our field. But Nalo just doesn't represent this, the Caribbean, immigrants, people of color. Um, she is also showing people what our genre is capable of. She represents us, all of us, in the science fiction field and raises us up onto the world stage. Many people talk about gateway books in our field, uh, but might even be shocked if I told them about the number of people I know of who've started reading science fiction because Nalo is just an amazing writer, period, and they got curious about her books. And when they were done with her books, they graduated onto other books, more science fiction, more fantasy. And it isn't just the readers that Nalo pulls into our field uh, that we're honoring her for. There are writers, many of them not as known to core genre circles, who have been encouraged by Nalo and many other fields to not only uh, raise up their own voices, but to feel comfortable about blurring genres and to reach for the fantastic. Nalo gives them permission to do this. Nalo has also edited several anthologies that raise writer voices, clear proof of the fact that she helps boost writers uh, through her mentoring, her care, and her presence in our field. As a teacher, Nalo also nurtures and builds up writers, young writers in this field with workshops she's taught, and then writers that she's reached out and mentored along the way. Uh, often when she had few resources and energy of her own to spend on that herself. And as a professor of writing, she continues that service in her daily life on campus. Lastly, Nalo has been a wonderful friend, a human being, a colleague, and such an amazing teller of stories in a group of friends or writers. For all of these reasons, as well as many that I've left on the cutting floor to make this a coherent and short speech for you, um, 
I'm just so proud to be here to give this award to Nalo. Nalo, you have excelled in our field as a multiple award nominee and winner. Uh, your work has rippled through our field and our literature. You have opened up the field to so many new voices and for so many readers. You have mentored and encouraged us. You've lifted up our field and uh, helped us compete on a global stage in all of literature. And you've done all of this and yet you're still the youngest grandmaster we have ever named. I'm so proud to see you gain this recognition, and I, for one, could not be more excited, Nalo, that you are our 37th Grandmaster for your contributions to our field. Thank you for being here, for being with us, and for doing what you do. We see you. We love you. We appreciate you. CIFWA supporters, CIFWA members, please give some mad big ups to the 37th CIFWA Grandmaster for Lifetime Achievement in Science Fiction and or fantasy, Nello Hopkinson. Feels like I'm never gonna stop smiling. Uh, thank you, Tobias, for that introduction. Made me a little bit weepy. Right now, I'm on the Southern California lands whose caretakers are the Kawiya, Tongva, Luceno, and Serrano peoples. I believe these lands should be returned to their stewardship. When I was preparing my comments, I went onto Wikipedia to find a list of all past grandmasters. The very last entry was my own name already up there and my heart jumped. It's still so unexpected. 10 years ago, my life improved when I began a professorship at the University of California, Riverside. My first permanent teaching position, and it was a tenured one. It was in stark contrast to the handful of years before it, in which I struggled with uterine fibroids, a disorder very common to people with uteruses and even more so to those of us who are black. The symptoms went undiagnosed for far too long, including an anemia so profound that when I was finally tested, the doctor who read the results was on the verge of hospitalizing me. Turns out that a dearth of oxygen makes sustained concentration kind of difficult. By then I was largely unable to read to the end of a sentence, much less write one. My writing career had taken a distinct downturn. My primary partner was also dealing with debilitating health issues and we were unable to do much in the way of work. We were lucky enough to sell our home and pay off our debts, but since we were unable to earn our livings, we had to go on the road, couch surfing with whoever would put us up for a few days, weeks, months. It gets better. The people who helped were from our communities, family, queer folks, socially aware activists and the like, many perhaps most of them in some way involved in science fiction community, fandom, critics, writers, scholars, artists, hobbyists, gamers, cosplayers, people of color, kinksters and poly people, not to mention the whole freaking staff of Locust Magazine who put us up for a few months in the home that houses the magazine. I guess I was their first writer in residence at a time in which I could barely write. Let me tell you, science fiction has its threads of concentrated nastiness, generally aimed at those of us who are already vulnerable to systemic oppression and hatred. But, but, I've also been fortunate enough to experience another aspect of this community, the habits and practices of acceptance and everyday generosity that hold a community together, that make a community stronger and more resilient. Some of the people who took us into our homes had never heard of us. They were going on the say-so of friends who vouched for us, who could attest that we were good guests who wouldn't terrorize their cats. To all of you, I just want to say thank you. You helped keep us alive until we could look after ourselves again. You helped me to heal enough that I was able to return to my writing and my art. I'm in a much better position health-wise and in so many other ways nowadays. Thank you for the part you played in that revitalization. As I embarked 10 years ago on becoming a professor, in the back of my mind was that mean-spirited mean aphorism, those who can't do, teach. Yeah, teaching is tiring. I have to find ways around my difficulty focusing. Reading and grading student work can be hell on the ADHD brain. But what I love is the moment when a light goes on behind a student's face, that delight when something I've shown them helps, helps them perceive the possibilities for their own art in ways they haven't before, and now they're itching to get back at it. That's just so rewarding. I defy anyone to convince me that teaching isn't its own form of creative practice. 
But it's true that there are those who see authors who teach for a living as being failed authors. What with that and having uh, a habitually undertreated medical condition that came close to destroying my ability to finish a story and with just plain getting older and no longer being the young hotshot in a very forgetful age, I've occasionally wondered how muted my impact on the industry has become, what might have been possible without those years of delay. So the Damon Knight Memorial Award was like a bolt of the blue. A bolt out of the blue. I didn't expect it at all. Of 37 Grand Master Awards given out since 1974, it has only gone once before to a Black person, Chip Delaney, and that was a mere seven years ago. Before this, it has only been given to seven women writers. It just wasn't on my radar as something for which to hope. But here I am. What this means to me is that my peers see me and the work I do, and that they think it has value. That's an extraordinarily precious thing for me to know. And as I look over the list of previous Grand Masters, I can see that it's slowly growing more representative. As I look at the support and advocacy work that CIFWA has been doing recently, I'm aware of initiatives the organization is outspokenly under undertaking to support emerging writers from traditionally underserved and marginalized communities. From bitter experience, one always fears that this kind of thing is a fad of the moment, but hell, I'm a science fiction writer. I know how to have hope for the future. Tobias just said that CIFWA sees me. Well, I see it too. I see the concrete steps it's taking to move beyond lip service, to not just tell, but to show. Please keep doing so. The benefits to this field are profound. Thank you for recognizing me with this award. And please know that I cherish it beyond what words can express. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations, Nalo. This evening, CIFWA is honored to recognize not just creators of outstanding fiction, but individuals whose work strengthens and enriches the science fiction and fantasy community. To present the Service to CIFWA Award, please welcome Nebula and Hugo Award-winning author, James Patrick Kelly. The last time I had the honor of introducing my dear friend Connie Willis was at the 2011 Nebula Awards, when she was named a Damon Knight Grandmaster. Back then, we recognized Connie as a writer who, among other achievements, had won seven Nebulas and 11 Hugos. You'd think that someone that busy wouldn't have the time for volunteer work, much less taking on the mostly thankless task of serving on CIFWA committees that are invisible to many of our members. I say, mostly thankless because tonight we are thanking her with the Kevin O'Donnell Jr. Service Award. Connie joined CIFWA just as soon as she qualified and has remained not only a member, but a staunch supporter through thick and thin. And believe me, there has been quite a bit of thick over the years. Take, for example, the awards, which we are about to give any minute now. The process of nominating and voting for the NEBS has ever been fraught with controversy, and the committee charged with sorting these controversies is the Awards Rules Committee. In 1990, then-President Ben Bova asked Connie to join Jack Williamson and Kevin O'Donnell Jr. on this committee. Over the years, we've worked to implement what seems in retrospect to have been innumerable rules changes as we brought the NEBS into the digital age. I say we because I also joined this committee in 2006. Last year, when Connie retired, she shipped me her paper files. Take a look. This is just the correspondence from before the turn of the century. Connie has also given decades-long service to the committee which administers the Emergency Medical Fund. The EMF helps our colleagues with emergency medical bills that threaten their ability to write. Maybe you've never heard of the EMF, since we respect the privacy of those who apply, but we've made a huge difference to many of our friends in need. 
When I joined this committee a couple of years ago, Connie and Lou Berger had just finished a major rewrite of the guidelines for awarding funds. It seems like I've been following Connie Willis around various CIFA committees for years, even though we both hate committees. But tonight, she follows me as the winner of the Kevin O'Donnell Jr. Service to CIFWA Award. Hi, thank you so much, Jim, for that introduction. And I'd like to sp say a special shout out to Nalo. Congratulations on being named a Grandmaster. That's so great. Um, I want to thank everybody so much for this lovely award. I do not really deserve it. In the first place, if the service was emceeing the nebulas, that was just really fun. In the second place, if it was teaching at Clarion and Clarion West, I love doing that and I've been rewarded every single day by the wonderful things my students have accomplished and the awards they've won. You Clarion people are all great. In the third place, if my service was being a committee member, well, I've been writing for years about the horrors of committees, how they constantly get off topic and spend hours on pointless minutia and squabble over things that do not matter. I even wrote a story about the worst committee of all time the one where the archangels were put in charge of planning the apocalypse and how they spent hours deciding who the antichrist should be and fighting over what the hell the heavenly choir should sing. You know, the hallelujah chorus has just been done to death and whether that pale horse of the four horsemen of the apocalypse was white or gray or a palomino or what, as you might expect, the planning didn't work out and the story was called why the world didn't end last Tuesday. So I figured my ending up on Suffolk committees was my punishment for that story and all the other stuff that I'd written and said and thought. But the thing is, it worked out great. I got to work with terrific people, sane and sensible and intelligent people like Jack Williamson, Jeff Carver, Chuck Von Rosbach, Kevin O'Donnell Jr., Tara LeMay, and James Patrick Kelly on the Nebula Rules Committee and deeply dedicated and caring people like Lou Berger, Robert Silverberg, Anatoly Belikovsky, Jerry Purnell, James Patrick Kelly again, and Oz Drummond on the Emergency Medical Fund Committee, plus Kat Rambo and Mary Robinette Kowal and countless other officers and members through the years. Every one of them has worked much harder and deserves this award more than I do. And they're only a small segment of all the people who have worked and continue to work to make SUFWA such a vital and thriving organization. This award should go to all of them, but I'm very grateful that you decided to give it to me. Oh, um, and I'd like to apologize for all the mean things I said about committees, mostly. This award is a wonderful honor. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Connie, and thank you for all you've done for CIFWA and for the science fiction and fantasy community. This year, CIFWA active members voted to recognize their peers in seven writing categories. The first of those tonight is the Nebula Award for Best Short Story. To set the stage, we welcome to the Airship Nebula award-winning short story author and essayist Nisi Shaw. I am going to talk a while about air canoes rather than zeppelins because I know more about my novel Everfair's Lighter Than Aircraft than I do about the CIFWA flagship Zeppelin named The Nebula. Okay, air canoes evolved over the course of the imaginary history of Everfair, the utopian nation where they originate. The first generation built in the late 1800s consisted of large but otherwise conventional wooden boats canoes, which were lofted by helium-filled bags in colorful rubberized bark cloth envelopes. Later, these were retrofitted with enclosed cabins, or they were replaced by new vessels featuring enclosed cabins, thus enabling higher altitude flights. 
steam engines fueled by reactions between the naturally radioactive earths native to the region propelled all generations of air canoes. They were still air canoes, but they evolved. Stories evolved too. Our nominees tonight developed out of the ongoing conversation we know as science fiction or fantasy or horror or speculative fiction. It has so many names, so many influences. It has so many great examples of the writer's art. And among these examples, we've selected the following standouts. The finalists for best short story are Badass Moms in the Zombie Apocalypse by Ray Carson. Advanced Word Problems in Portal Math by Amy Peakey. A Guide for Working Breeds by Veena Giamin Prasad. The Eight Thousanders by Jason Sanford. My Country is a Ghost by Evgenia Triantafilou. Open House on a Haunted Hill by John Wiswell. And The Nebula for Best Short Story goes to... Open House on Haunted Hill by John Wiswell from Diabolical Plots. Congratulations. Open House on Haunted Hill tells the story of 133 Poisonwood Avenue, a vacant house in search of a family to call it home. This is John Wiswell's first Nebula nomination and first win for Best Short Story. Hello, esteemed colleagues. Uh, Tonight, I thank you for this staggering honor because I'm not just a longtime fan of the nebulas. As an asthmatic, I've been using a nebulizer for years. I'm elated, I'm elated to that my haunted house could touch you all like this. And the best way that I can mark this honor, well, there's two. There's one, there's humor, which we've covered. And the other is to revel in the excellence all around me. I came to believe that I could write the gentle and strange things that I do because of the richness of this field that nourishes me. Because I wrote a few thousand of the words that helped get us through last year, but there were a few thousand out of the millions of the words that make up the tapestry of our field. So I, I thank the voters and I thank SIF at large. And I have, to, I have to thank the people who contributed to the space wherein I felt I could have a home. And they're people like Nat Natalia Theodoridou and Evionia Triantafilu and Mark Van Wolfmore and Marissa Lingen, who's like a sister to me, and Kelly Link and Ted Chiang, Danny Lohr and Vina Prasad and J.R. Dawson and T.J. Berry and P.H. Lee and A.C. Wise, A.T. Greenblatt, C.L. Polk. I mean, we're talking like the whole alphabet soup of brilliance here. It's because when I write a story today, I'm writing to contribute to the body of work that you're all creating. And that's our great privilege as writers. And it's why I read. And it's why I write, and we should never lose sight that singular excellence pales before the greatness of community. Now saying that, there is like one other person that I have to, I have to thank because, and I know it's a little gauche, but I hope they're listening because my story, Open House on Haunted Hill, which you've all been so kind to, was rejected several times before Diabolical Plots gave it a chance. And I'm deeply grateful to them for it. And in my career, Various stories were rejected a cumulative over 800 times before I won this award tonight. And that's why I hope this author is listening. You who think you're not a good enough writer because you don't write like someone else. You who haven't finished a draft because your project seems too quirky or daunting. You who are dispirited after eating so many rejection emails. You who are going to write the things that make me glad I'm alive to read them. What the field needs is for you to be different and true to your imagination. Please, in the next couple of weeks, go back to the document you can't look at and finish that story and then go write the next one and the next one after it. Because you don't know when you're gonna come into your own. So you gotta endure as you can and you've always gotta take care of yourself. Because I toiled for years just to sell any story at all. And because I was publishing for a decade, before I got this platform to say this to you tonight, there is no story that I want to read more than yours. Thank you for what your words are going to mean to me tomorrow. And with that, thank you again to everyone who was touched by Open House on Haunted Hill and who supports my work in general. 
I hope that you have as lovely a weekend as you've given me. God bless you. Good night. And happy pride. One thirty three Poisonwood only ever had one person ever die under its roof. Back in nineteen eighty nine, Doratya Blasco had refused hospice and spent two and a half months enjoying the sound of the wind on one thirty three Poisonwood's shingles. One thirty three Poisonwood played its heart out for her every day. The house misses nineteen eighty nine. It has spent so much of the time since vacant. Today, it is going to change that. Again, congratulations, John. Hello, human. Can you understand me? I have been studying you since I discovered your vessel, and my research suggests this is your preferred method of communication. Um, uh, what the what now? Who, who are you? I am me. I am all things and nothing. I consist of space and matter, but am also an entity beyond the physical. I am a river. No, uh, a towel. Ooh, the three ages of man. <laughs> I love riddles. I am not a riddle. I am what you have been calling the habitat. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there something you'd rather be called? Wait, bigger question. Is it okay that we're here? Are, are, are we bothering you? Uh, we didn't realize you were sentient. Oh, this is so awkward. I... Habitat will do. And it is not awkward. I spend most of my existence alone, but I sometimes seek out company to meet new beings and learn their stories. Your airship has many tellers of stories. I have learned much. It has brought me quantifiable enjoyment. Although... Uh, yes? The one that flies and breathes fire. His stories tickle. Uh, Cuddles, you, you've seen him. Where is he now? Mm, I will check. Uh, I guess Habitat is gone. And also sentient. And like stories. That's really cool and definitely not the weirdest thing that has happened to me in the last year. So, while the Habitat is looks going to look for cuddles, let's get back to the awards. In addition to the Nebulas tonight, Sifwa is also honoring three recipients of the Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award. Presenting the first of these is Sifwa Director at Large and incoming president, Rita Award-winning author, Jeffy Kennedy. The Kate Willem Solstice Award is given by CEFWA for distinguished contributions to the science fiction and fantasy community. This year, we are recognizing Roxanne Longstreet Conrad, perhaps best known by her pseudonym, Rachel Kane. Normally, we like to give this award to someone who is still among us to celebrate what a vital part of our community they are. Unfortunately, we lost Rox to cancer in November of 2020, and her loss is a great one for the genre, the readers, and for other authors. She was a New York Times, USA Today, and number one Wall Street Journal bestselling author of more than 50 books in numerous genres and categories. She wrote thrillers, mysteries, horror, urban fantasy, science fiction, as well as young adult. She is well known for her Weather Warden urban fantasy series, a nine book series with a four book spinoff, The Outcast Season. She wrote the Stillhouse Lake thriller series. And she is greatly beloved for her Morganville vampire books, which consisted of at least 14 novels and numerous shorter works uh, embraced by an entire generation of young adult readers. Perhaps my personal favorite is The Prince of Shadows, a wonderful, illuminating retelling of Romeo and Juliet told from Ben Volio's point of view as he and Rosalind struggle to, present, to prevent a great curse from destroying their families. It's deftly told, subtly and evocatively written, 
which was true of everything that Rox wrote. I became aware of Rachel Kane when I found her Weather Warden urban fantasy series in my small Wyoming town bookstore. But when I met her was when I became enraptured by who she was as a person. Over and over, people have spoken of how generous she was, which is the best word to describe her. She was good to readers. She made even newbie writers feel comfortable. And she embraced everyone in a way that was truly exemplary. I wish that we could do more than give her this award posthumously. But I'd also invite you all to celebrate the life and the wonderful person who was Roxanne Longstreet Conrad, Rachel Kane. Hello, everyone. I'm here today speaking on behalf of Rachel Kane. Were she here, she would find the words far better than I. After all, she found the right words for over 30 years, reaching a new generation of readers in imaginative ways. And what better way to reach readers than through the creative mediums of science fiction and fantasy? It is in the spirit and the enduring tradition of genre fiction that we accept this award on her behalf. Thank you, Jeffy and Kat. Rachel's legacy lives on in our community, and we are all the richer for it. Our next award is the Ray Bradbury Nebula Award for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation. Hugo-nominated author, podcaster, and filmmaker Mallory O'Mara is here to introduce this year's finalists. Hi. I'm Mallory O'Mara, and I like watching stuff. In this strange new universe that we've all had to inhabit, films and television shows have become more important than ever before. They give us inspiration. They give us hope. They give us an escape from the four walls we've been stuck in, in apartment buildings, houses, even spaceships, whatever the case may be. But they also give us something maybe even more important, community. In fact, being able to talk about the movies and the shows that we're watching is one of the few communal experiences that's been available to us for the past year and a half. Whether that's talking about them on the couch with your family, or in Zoom rooms with friends, or even with people that you don't know on Twitter. Man, that movie like sucks! Mm, not like that. Wherever they're being expressed, the following television shows and films that are up for the Ray Bradbury Nebula Award for Best Dramatic Presentation have been shown a lot of love from viewers like you. And the nominees are Birds of Prey and the Fantabulous Emancipation of One Harley Quinn by Christina Hodson. The Expanse, Galgamela by Dan Nowak. The Good Place, Whenever You're Ready by Michael Shore. Lovecraft Country, Season One by Misha Green, Shannon Houston, Kevin Lau, Wes Taylor, Ihoma Oforie, Jonathan I. Kidd, and Sonia Winton Odomton. The Mandalorian, The Tragedy by John Favreau. And The Old Guard by Greg Rucka. And the Ray Bradbury Nebula Award for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation goes to The Good Place, Whenever You're Ready, by Michael Schur from NBC, Fremulin 3 Arts Entertainment, and Universal. Congratulations. Whenever You're Ready is the series finale for The Good Place, a show about death, demons, the value of humanity, and what we owe to each other. This is Michael Schur's second nomination and first win for the Ray Bradbury Nebula Award for Outstanding Dramatic Presentation. Hi, I'm Mike Shore, creator of The Good Place, and it is such an honor to accept the Ray Bradbury Award for Dramatic Presentation. I thought it only fitting that I'd be joined today by David Neednagel. David was the visual effects guru for the show and was responsible for bringing so much of the world of The Good Place to life. Hello, David. 
Hello, uh, I just wanted to say that I've dreamt of an opportunity like this my entire career. <laughs> and... <laughs> oh, sorry, David. David, David, David. Uh, I'm sorry. I thought you understood that I would be doing all of the talking today, right? My show, my award, right? Remember? Oh, sorry. My bad. My bad. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so, winning an award from the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America is a true thrill. Um, we have big ambitions for the show. It was the first time I had ever personally worked in the science fiction space, and I guess I did pretty well, <laughs> right? Won an award, so uh, kind of a home run my first time at bat, which is, um, you know, it's pretty great. Um, there are a few other people I need to thank uh, who helped realize my vision and bring my ideas to the fore. Um, let's see, our producers, Morgan Sacken and David Hyman, our editors, Eric Kissick and Matthew Freund, our costume designers, Kirsten Mann and Alexis Jacks, our property master, Gabe Perello, our director of photography, David Miller, all the directors who directed the show. They all deserve credit. Obviously not as much as I do, right? But they deserve some credit. They deserve an appropriate amount of credit that's sort of lower than the amount of credit that I deserve, right? Somewhere in here, you get it. Um, and of course the cast, who can forget the incredible cast, my goodness, Ted Danson, Kristen Bell, William Jackson Harper, Jamila Jamil, Manny Jacinto, and Darcy Carden. Granted, we gave them gold every week, but uh, they didn't screw it up, <laughs> right? They didn't screw up the nearly perfect scripts that we handed them, put in their lap every single week. So congrats to them for not screwing it up. But in the end, it really is about me, I think, and what I did and what I accomplished. And I think that's why everyone who worked on the show admires me and, and more importantly, respects me. That's the word I think of when I think about how other people see me is respect. It's really about respect. And if you don't have respect, you don't have anything. And I have it, and that's clear. So thank you again for this incredible honor and good night. Congratulations again, Michael. Our next award tonight is presented to Ben Bova by his good friend, NASA physicist, author, and futurist, Les Johnson. It is my distinct honor to be presenting one of this year's Kate Wilhelm Solstice Awards to the late Ben Bova for his distinguished contributions to the science fiction and fantasy community. Ben had a long history working as a writer, journalist, and editor. A few of his most notable achievements include serving as the editor for both Analog Magazine and Omni Magazine, as well as becoming President Emeritus of the National Space Society. Along the way, he wrote over 100 books and received six Hugo Awards. His work touched my life personally and professionally over many years, beginning in middle school and high school when I was reading his Kinsman and Exile series. I devoured every issue of Analog that I could get my hands on, which he edited at the time, and marveled at Omni, which was an incredible magazine and all too short-lived, for which he also served as editor. He actually influenced my decision to study physics and go to work for NASA. As a side note, I didn't know it till recently, but he also wrote at least one episode in the series, The Land of the Lost, one of the secret treasures that I really enjoyed uh, on TV when I was in elementary school. I didn't meet Ben until 1988 when I invited him to come to Huntsville to give a keynote address at a space conference here. I was trying to bring together my love of science fiction with the space community and get something going. Our paths crossed many times after that at various conferences and science fiction conventions. And little did I know uh, at the time that I would eventually write a book with Ben called Rescue Mode, which was published by Bayon Books in 2014. In our collaboration, Ben was, of course, the lead author. He was very kind and very gentle in his critique of my work, and I learned a lot about writing from working with him. I have to admit, though, when I found out I'd be writing a book with Ben, I was terrified. Um, I reread his Mars novel, which is incredible. If you haven't read it, you need to. 
and his book, How to Write Science Fiction That Sells. As we worked together, he was kind and we became friends. It was really nice to get to know Ben at a level beyond just Ben the speaker and editor. Bova's Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award honors his many editorial contributions and his constant work to improve the science fiction genre, an honor well-deserved. I'm honored to receive this award for Ben Bova. I found a cute little article that he had written about the Nebula Awards. I was, thought that would be very appropriate to read this at this moment. Introduction to Nebula Showcase 2008 by Ben Bova. I have had a love affair with science fiction since first I learned to read. In fact, one of my incentives for learning to read was action comics featuring Superman. Ben's my Superman in science fiction. It knocked me off my five-year-old butt and started a lifelong fascination with astronomy, rocketry, and of course, science fiction. That one image taught me an important lesson. The universe changes sometimes abruptly, dramatically, and catastrophically. And the literature of change is the aforementioned genre of science fiction. SFWA began in the fertile mind of Damon Knight. He and his wife, Kathy Wilman. But SFWA began to establish the professional integrity of science fiction and fantasy Universities began taking the field and teaching co courses on it. Science fiction and fantasy have matured and so has SFWA. The organization is thriving and has been a strong advocate for writers in their never ending struggle with publishers and producers. You hold in your hands the Nebula Showcase 2008, you will see a broad variety of story types, themes, and treatments, which is only natural since the field of science fiction and fantasy encompasses all of time, all of the space, all of the universe within the human soul, and then some. Have a pleasant journey. Ben Bova, Naples, Florida, June 2007. Thank you very much. And again, I also would like to thank the SFWA organizers and organization and who have worked so hard to make this event happen. And thank you, Liz Johnson. Thank you, Lass and Rashida. Ben's memory and legacy of service to our community will endure. Our next presenter has done a lot of things. It's kind of their brand. Tonight, they honor our five finalists for the Andre Norton Nebula Award for Middle Grade and Young Adult Fiction. Please welcome award-winning author and center of the Mark Does, Stuff's, Mark Does Stuff Cinematic Universe, Mark Oshiro. Hello, friends. I'm coming to you from sunny Brooklyn, New York. And like practically all of you, I had to reconfigure my life around a world that was deeply and quickly changing. So I created this tiny space to hopefully pull inspiration from the world around me by quite literally surrounding myself with books. And I bring that up because as a children's literature author myself, I'm always thinking about transformation. How do children move from one world to another, from childhood to adolescence, from adolescence to adulthood? How do they choose to transform their own lives when faced with things like Starfire, a mysterious car accident, a crown prince, an assassin, or a mischievous fox? So it is a great privilege to be asked to present this specific award, one that honors and celebrates the work done within our community 
Well, I am in my own space where I celebrate the written word every single day. I'm delighted that I get to play the tiniest, the tiniest role uh, for my friends and colleagues who are writing Kidlet, who believe that fantastical worlds brimming with magic and possibility should be given to children too. So I hope you'll join me in uplifting the wonderful work these five authors have done in service of youth. The nominees for the Andre Norton Nebula Award for Middle Grade and Young Adult Fiction are Ray Bear by Jordan Fueco, A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking by T. Kingfisher, Star Daughter by Shweta Takrar, Elatsoe by Darcy Little Badger, A Game of Fox and Squirrels by Jen Reese. And the Andre Norton Nebula Award for Middle Grade and Young Adult Fiction goes to. A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking by T. T. Kingfisher from Argyle. Congratulations. A Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking follows 14-year-old Mona, a bread wizard, with a sourdough starter for her familiar. Her life changes forever when she finds a dead body on her bakery floor. T. Kingfisher has previously won the award for Best Short Story as Ursula Vernon. This is her first nomination and win for the Andre Norton Nebula Award for Middle Grade and Young Adult Fiction. Hi everybody, I'm Ursula Vernon, aka T. Kingfisher, the author of Wizard's Guide to Defensive Baking. And if you're watching this message, that means that it won the Andre Norton Award. Dude, wow, thank you. Uh, it's I'm very honored. I would like to thank my husband, Kevin, who puts up with, you know, a lot, and my publisher at Argyle, who did such great uh, print volumes on Wizard's Guide. And this is so strange because, I'll be honest with you, I started this book back in 2007, maybe, uh, because I wanted a excuse to write off a KitchenAid mixer as a business expense. And it seemed like writing a fantasy novel about a wizard who only worked with baked goods meant that I could buy the KitchenAid mixer. And uh, anyway, that was, that was, other people have much better stories about how they thought of their books, I'll be honest. So I bought the KitchenAid mixer in red. I finished the book a couple years later. I sold it to a publisher. The publisher sat on it for about three years and no shade on them. They were really, really trying, but they eventually came back and said, we have no idea what to do with this book. Uh, we don't know it's middle grade or it's YA and it's a little dark or maybe it's not dark enough or maybe it's way too dark. They tried, they didn't know what to do. And so they sold it back to me in return for another book as sometimes happens. And then my beloved agent shopped it around to a whole bunch of other children's book places and they all came back and said, we like this, but we also don't know what to do with it. And uh, so it sat unsold until 2020. And then all of a sudden everyone was into sourdough starters and distrusting the government. And suddenly this book's time had come. So uh, I was delighted to be able to self-publish it then uh, with the help of Argyle Press. And the reaction was far in excess of what I ever anticipated. Uh, people occasionally ask how much of that I changed in editing to make it, you know, to bring it up to date. And the answer is very, very little. I, 99% uh, of the stuff that felt really relevant last year, I wrote in 2012, 2008, somewhere around there. And uh, yeah, some things don't change as much as we wish they did. So thank you all very much. This is an incredible honor. I apologize for all the rooster noises in the background, but there's nothing I can do because roosters are like that. And uh, wow, I want a nebula. Cool. <laughs> I could tell right away that she was dead. I haven't seen a lot of dead bodies in my life. I'm only 14, and baking's not exactly a high mortality profession. But the red stuff oozing out from under her head definitely wasn't raspberry filling. 
and she was lying at an awkward angle that nobody would choose to sleep in, even assuming they'd break into a bakery to take a nap in the first place. Congratulations again, Ursula. Is, is that you? Or are, you are you back? Do you got eyes on cuddles? I did not go anywhere. I am everywhere and nowhere. But I believe I have found the dragon known as Cuddles. Oh, thank God. Is he warm enough? Did he ask about me? Does he look like he misses me? I am not certain. But he did attempt to eat several of the potted plants in the space you have designated as by the potted plants. Oh, that's weird. He never tries to eat my plants, but then again, the only plant I have is this. So. Uh, but thank you, Habitat. It's so good to know that Cuddles is okay and apparently hungry. Um, not sure what to do about that, So, but I'm sure we'll figure it out. So on with the show. Here to present our final Solstice, Solstice Award of the Night, Hugo nominated and Eisner winning illustrator, John Jennings. Greetings, my name is John Jennings and I am here to present the Solstice Award at the 56th Annual Nebula Award. Um, as you can see, I am recording directly and uh, from my own Zeppelin uh, cockpit here. We're undergoing a, a few um, minor updates, so we're gonna be back in the air pretty soon. But um, it is my extreme honor to do this presentation for the 56th Annual Nebula Awards. And again, my name is John Jennings. Um, so a little bit about the honoree really quickly. Um, person we are, that we are honor, honoring with the, the Solstice Award uh, right now is, uh, has been involved in various forms of multimedia for over 25 years. He has done graphic design, web design, video animation, and, and various types of multimedia projects. Uh, he has been the diversity track uh, manager, uh, director for uh, DragonCon, um, also as a coordinator for Tennessee State University Media Center. And he is also um, the, the main editor for the Black Science Fiction Society's Genesis Magazine. It's an anthology of science fiction uh, that deals with diversity and uh, representation in science fiction. Um, so basically, um, I met this gentleman a few years ago and I uh, was very impressed with his work. And I am very, very um, glad to be uh, giving this uh, award to my friend and colleague, Jarvis Sheffield. He is the, uh, the 2021 honoree for the Solstice Award from the Nebula uh, Awards. And um, I'm very, very proud of him and I'm and thankful for this opportunity. Hello everyone, I hope all is well with you and your families. For those that don't know me, I'm Jarvis Sheffield, Media Center Coordinator with the Historic Tennessee State University. I'm also the Diversity Track Director with DragonCon and creator of Black Science Fiction Society. My goal has been to facilitate environments where people, no matter what color, creed, nationality, origin, age, orientation, or ability are provided equal opportunity to grow, learn and be represented positively and fairly. I am a recipient of this year's Kate Wilhelm Solstice Award. I'm extremely excited about this honor and I wanna thank everyone that has supported me and my dreams, aspirations um, along the way. This was completely unexpected, but I am grateful and humbled. Being mentioned in the same sentence with greats like my favorite science fiction writer, the multi-award winning Octavia Butler and prophylic author Carl Sagan is extremely high praise. My wife, family, friends, and supporters have been the cornerstone of my successes and you all have my sincere thanks. I wanna thank the fantastic people at the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America for recognizing my efforts in speculative fiction and all the great work that you do. Isaac Asimov once said, today's science fiction is tomorrow's science fact. With that said, having diverse voices at the science fiction speculative fiction table can encourage cooperation and cohesion that our entire society needs. 
Many late nights, early mornings, late days, time, energy, and resources were spent trying to carve out a niche in this crowded speculative fiction landscape because I believe that representation matters and that we all deserve opportunities to shine and fulfill our potential. Like, like, like Kay Wilhelm, whose award this is named after, I have worked to break barriers and provide safe spaces for all people that love science fiction and fantasy to communicate, support, collaborate, and thrive together. Thank you again. This is a great honor and privilege that I do not take lightly none of which could have been possible without others that have supported my vision throughout the years. It's an awesome feeling to get your flowers while you're still living. Last, I wanna encourage young and old alike to follow your dreams, be humble, be consistent, and apply the time and action needed to see your dreams through to the end. By doing this, you'll make the world a little better place then you found it. I wanna thank all of those that came before me, that have paved the way for others and have broadened the scope of speculative fiction in our society. I want to congratulate all the nominees and winners of awards at this year's ceremony. And I will all, <clears throat> and I wish all of you a great Nebula Award experience. I hope that you enjoy all the fantastic programming in store for you. Thank you and God bless. Congratulations, Jarvis. Thank you for sharing your vision of the kind of place the science fiction and fantasy community can be and for all the work you've done to make that vision a reality. Now, although tonight is about celebration, it's also a chance for our community to gather and honor those who have recently departed. This year in particular has been marked by loss on a global scale. Please join us as we take a pause in remembrance.
Our next award tonight honors the writers of novelettes that have intrigued, provoked, and transformed us over the past year. Here to introduce our finalist is Hugo-nominated writer, editor, founder of FIACON, and chair of this year's Nebula Conference, L.D. Lewis. Hi, I'm L.D. Lewis, greeting you here from my generously appointed captain's quarters aboard the airship Nebula. I'm delighted to present this year's novelette category. The novelette, as only some of us know, is that rare, underappreciated middle child of narrative structure, in length between the short story and the novella. This year's finalists are a brilliant place to start if you still can't quite figure out what that looks like. The finalists for this year are Stepsister by Leah Sipas, The Pill by Meg Elison, Burn or the Episodic Life of Sam Wells as a Super by A.T. Greenblatt. Two Truths and a Lie by Sarah Pinsker. Where You Linger by Bonnie Jo Stufflebeam. And Shadow Prisons by Caroline M. Yoakum. Congratulations again to all of our finalists. I wish you a happy and safe rest of your voyage. And the Nebula for Best Novelette goes to... Two Truths and a Lie by Sarah Pinsker from Tor.com. Two Truths and a Lie tells the story of Stella, a liar who struggles to remember the truth of her childhood past on The Uncle Bob Show. Sarah Pinsker has been nominated 10 times for Nebula Awards and previously won. Oh my goodness. Um... Thank you so much. I, I was so sure I wasn't going to win this time that I can't eat. Like I, I, I wrote down names, which is what I always promise myself to do. I'll write down names at the very least. But, um, and I want to say uh, Meg and Leah and Eliza and Bonnie Jo and Carolyn, uh, you, you wrote such wonderful stories and, and um, I was rooting. Uh, uh, they, you, you're wonderful. And I want to say um, thank you to everyone who voted for my story. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone else. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank, thank you to, to uh, Ellen Dethlow and everyone at tour.com. Um, uh, this was the first story I got to work with Ellen. I've been reading Ellen's stories forever and everything that she's edited. And, and I never thought I would write something scary enough for her. So that was, that was uh, I'm chuffed and uh, apologetic to my family who doesn't read horror for that. Um, I want to say thank you to everyone at Sycamore Hill Workshop in 2019, um, particularly to Usman Malik, who wrote to Ellen to hit me up for this story uh, before I had even made it from the classroom up to uh, back to my room. Um, so so um, the this, this story has had boosters from the beginning and I wanna say thank you to all of you. Um, uh, everyone else who saw a draft of this that includes my critique groups and my family, um, my, my wonderful supportive family and um, my wife Zoo 
who is in the other room two minutes behind, um, but has probably picked up that, that, um, that I'm giving a speech now. So, so um, uh, but she's doing, last year, last year there was so much celebration that the dog had to come and join. So um, this is, we're doing better. Um, uh, all of my writing and editing buddies, including everybody who uh, has gotten on a Zoom this year and written with me, uh, it's been amazing. And I really appreciate all of you. Um, that doesn't have to do with this story, but that has to do with every story. And um, also, lastly, this is the, the piece with the longest gestation of any story I've ever written. Um, a fragment of my first draft of this was something that I wrote for my, my senior college uh, independent workshop 20 years ago um, and for Madison Smart Bell um, in my independent study, who for the last two years I've worked with at that college again, um, come full circle. So I kind of am excited to say thank you to him for working with me 20 years ago on that story that became this story. Um, and that is my cue to say, uh, I, John Wiswell gave a great speech about that story that you're going to write tomorrow. And um, so this is, this is my pep talk about the story that you wrote yesterday that may yet be the story that, that does something for you tomorrow. This one took 20 years to get right. Um, have patience and and yeah, just thank you all. Do you remember the Uncle Bob show? Which of course he didn't. Nobody did. She had made it up on the spot like she often did. Which was why it was so weird that Marco said, Yeah, and the way he looked straight into the camera, it was like he saw me specifically me. Scared to death, but he said, come back next week. And I always did, because I felt like he'd get upset otherwise. As he said it, Stella remembered too. Congratulations again, Sarah. Oh, Cuddles loved that story. I hope he comes back. He will. He will? Oh, that's great! He won't. What? He might. Okay. Are you a Habitat or a Magic 8-Ball? I am all things. I embody all possibilities. If he is eating potted plants, maybe you could tempt him back with something he would find more tasty. Well, that's great, but all I have is like half a thing of yogurt and this weird sourdough. I have cheese curds. What? Ha how? I embody all things, including cheese curds. Was I not clear? I shall see if your space dragon might want some. Oh, thank you so much. I okay, well, that's never going to not be weird. Okay, in the meantime, I am so excited to introduce our next presenter, world fantasy award-winning author and Hugo-nominated editor Troy Wiggins, who is here to recognize our six finalists in the category of best novella. Hello, fellow passengers of the Airship Nebula. My name is Troy L. Wiggins, and I am honored to present the finalists for the 2021 Nebula Award for Best Novella. I distinctly remember, as a fledgling writer, more accomplished writers advising us to avoid the novella. Novellas weren't safe with their wibbly-wobbly word count requirements, and they're not quite a novel status. We were advised to skip the form until later in our careers. Novellas were labeled a hard sell. But things in this genre, community, and universe inevitably change, and I was able to watch in real time as science fiction and fantasy readers, writers, and publishers of all sizes and structures work together to create a novella revolution. Not only were novellas being published more frequently, but they were amazing works of literature. Writers who wanted to tell their brilliant, daring, and incisive stories were able to do so in a format that many readers would appreciate. And now, in 2021, so many of the most exhilarating and enjoyable stories occupy that precious, inexact space called the novella. The finalists that we celebrate tonight have given us novellas that have challenged us, thrilled us, and called us to persist in our searches for truth, meaning, and beauty. And you can finish the stories in one long afternoon. Here are the finalists for Best Novella. Tower of Mud and Straw by Yaroslav Barsakov. Fina by Nino Sipri. Ring Shout by Fenderson J. Lee Clark. 
Efe Ioku, The Tale of Imade Unu Gabon by Ajinachawe Donald Epeki. The Four Profound Weaves by R.B. Lindbergh. And Riot Baby by Tochi Onyebuchi. And the Nebula Award for Best Novella goes to... Oh. Ring Shout by Fenderson Jelly Clark from Tor.com. Congratulations. Ring Shout is a dark fantasy historical novella that follows Maurice Boudreau and her group of friends as they attempt to eliminate the Ku Klux monsters from 1920s Georgia. Clark has previously been nominated for Best Novella and won Best Short Story. This is his first previously been nominated for Best Novella and won Best Short Story. This is his first. Uh, hey everyone. Uh, wow, <laughs> this is unbelievable. Uh, I I didn't expect this. Um, I guess I want to express my, I have something written here and I'm trying to see if I can read it uh, because my emotions are all over the place. I want to express my humble and heartfelt gratitude for this award. Um, I think as I noted in the book, uh, this story found life between everything from, you know, some Beyonce videos to uh, actual ring shout songs. Uh, it was such a mashup. I didn't think anyone uh, could have prepared me for how favorably it will be received. Um, I sure didn't expect it, for instance, to make the opening uh, song uh, in the ceremony. Um, it's just been beyond my expectations. Uh, first of all, I want to, of course, thank my auntie editor, Diana Foe, for taking a chance on this quirky story. If you remember, I pitched this to you that spring day sitting in a DC coffee shop, you were on the phone in New York, and I said, I have this weird idea. And you listened to it and you said, yeah, sure. So it's just a reminder that gatekeepers remain important, right? Because I don't know how many others would have given this the green light, uh, best editor ever. Um, thanks to the entire Tor.com uh, Tor team for helping get this out the door all the copy editors and everyone else. You guys are like magical beings out of fillery. I keep saying this. Um, thanks to my agent, uh, Seth Fishman, who really believed in the story. I want more cake and this time make it red velvet. We want a red velvet cake this time. Just you know with the good sour cream, make sure you get it from the good spot. Um, I want to thank CIFWA, the voters and everyone who helped, uh, who helped put on the ceremony. As writers, you know, we live for this. Uh, I want to thank especially all the readers who've helped share, review, and publicize this novella from Twitter to podcasts to the fantastic folks on Instagram. Decentered Lit, I see you. Um, wouldn't be here without you. Um, big ups to all the other finalists, Tochi, everyone. You guys had phenomenal stories. Again, uh, thank you for, sh for allowing me to share this spot with all of you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Troy Wiggins, who, you know, gave the uh, thing here. Hey, bro, you know, you said this is where we're going to be. Here we at. OK, so thanks to the WPA X slave narrative archives that gave me the inspiration and the varied strands of African-American Southern folklore that really drove this story and gave it meaning. Uh, thank you to H-Town that raised me, everybody off Hiram Clark, Sims Bayou, Juneteenth picnics in Herman and McGregor Park. This story is for you. Um, thank you to Danny, Nia, and Naya, and all the inspirational Black women in my life who helped give Maurice, Chef, and Sadie uh, their own life. And really, again, thanks, everyone. Uh, good night, and may the gods bless. Thank you. We the storm on the horizon. He answers, a twinkle in his gray eyes. But you can call us Clyde. Butcher Clyde. We thought we'd introduce ourselves proper, since you gonna left this nice little space open for us to slip into. Good of you to leave this little open for us to slip into. Storm. Nana Jean's words dance play in my head. Bad weather gon' come. Congratulations again, Fenderson. 
In 2020, many of us found ourselves needing a break from reality, and that didn't always mean reading words on a page. Presenting the finalist for best game writing, I give you author, narrative designer, and Nebula winner, Carrie Patel. The past year has changed the way many of us live and work. It's altered the rhythms of how we tune in and how we unplug. It's moved the boundaries of our private spaces and removed many of the territories that are familiar to us. Fundamentally, this year has transformed the way we situate ourselves in the world. For many of us, games have been a crucial source of both connection and escape. They've allowed us to recreate game nights with family members in different cities and different households. They've given us experiences to share with the friends we love and miss. And they've transported us to virtual worlds that have, at times, been a much needed source of respite from the uncertainty around us. The stories we find in games are unique in that they invite us to participate. They involve us in experiences outside our own, where we can build empathy for the characters we meet and find community with our fellow players. By inviting us to play, games encourage us to let our guard down and embrace our curiosity and our sense of wonder as we explore new worlds, connect with others, and seek out new challenges. And this year's nominees represent some of the most transcendent experiences that game stories can bring us. In Blazeball, we've seen how a game about absurdist fun can bring us together when we all need a little more joy and connection. Hades has shown us how we can overcome the obstacles we faced again and again with perseverance and a little help from the people who care about us. The Luminous Underground has shown us that when we look closely, we can find magic and mystery beneath the ordinary and the mundane. Through Kentucky Route Zero, we've celebrated the inexplicable magic of being lost and found and the transformative power of journeys. With sense and semiosis, we're reminded of how our senses connect us to memory and meaning and how the familiar and the vivid can transport us. And in Spiritfarer, we embarked on a beautiful voyage and experienced the healing and the comfort that comes from caring for our found family. Thank you to all of our wonderful nominees and to the many creators who have brightened our year with story, connection, and play. And the Nebula Award for Best Game Writing goes to... Hades by Greg Kasavin from Publisher. Congratulations. Hades is a roguelike dungeon crawler in which players control Zagreus, the son of Hades, as he attempts to escape from the underworld to reach Mount Olympus. Players are at times aided by gifts bestowed on him from other Olympians, creating unique levels with each playthrough. Oh my goodness, thank you so, so very much. Uh, this means more than I can say, and seeing as I'm supposed to be a writer, it's a bit humbling. Uh, I think it would be easier for me to type out my thoughts right now, uh, but I'll do my best to try and express them. Um, you know, so many uh, authors whose work has left a permanent impression on me uh, have been recipients of or finalists in the Nebula Awards uh, in the past, so all the more reason this means uh, more than I can say. Um, the category of game writing is, is quite new to the Nebula, so thank you so much to Sifwa for uh, even recognizing our craft. It's kind of an emerging field in some ways, um, and I think any of us working as game writers, all uh, my fellow finalists whose work has been so inspiring, uh, we can all agree there's so much left for us to learn in our own disciplines and, and from each other. And we know that games are capable of creating really powerful emotions, uh, and those emotions can include a sense of wonder um, and uh, a sense of empathy and love. Um, and I so appreciate the work that you're doing uh, to push those boundaries uh, and, and explore what games can do um, in that regard. And I can't wait to see what you do next. But to my colleagues at Supergiant Games, um, I can't thank you enough for letting me do this job. Uh, I've been working with some of these folks for more than 10 years. So Amir, Gavin, Andrew, Jen, Darren, Logan, uh, what can I say? I love you guys. Your work has been incredibly inspiring to me and always makes me strive to do my best. Uh, thank you for uh, creating an environment where we never have to question the value of storytelling in games. Um, Hades is a game about family, and I would be uh, nowhere if not for mine. Um, 
you know, growing up in this country as a Russian Jewish uh, immigrant, informed a game about the underworld of Greek myth more than you might expect. So to my mom, my dad, my brother, Alex, uh, Babushka, uh, thank you for supporting me, believing in me, letting me chase this uh, crazy dream of mine to combine my love of writing and my love of games. Um, and uh, to my wonderful wife, Jenna, our, our lovely kids, uh, you've kept me sane, such as can be, uh, during all this, uh, and I couldn't have done any of this uh, without you. Um, I love you so much. Uh, finally, I'd be remiss uh, if I didn't thank the gods themselves. The gods of Olympus, you know, appreciate the adoration of us mortals, but uh, the Chthonic gods, the gods of the underworld, uh, while working on Hades, I would sometimes wonder what would they think about us shining a spotlight on them like this. I hope they'd be okay with it, and I have to believe that given this outcome that uh, maybe we earn their seal of approval after all. So thank you, gods above and below. Thank all of you out there. Hope to see you again. one more time. Stupid boy, you shall never reach the surface. You'll have a better home where you belong, here on Olympus. And to help you on your journey, have my blessing. The Olympians shall make powerful allies. You can turn back, or I can send you home the painful way. What'll it be? I'll have to go with the painful way. That was for last time. Sorry about the technical difficulties there, but another big congratulations to Greg. And we have come to our last award of the night and Cuddle still isn't back, so I suppose we'll just have to... May I do this intro? Oh, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. It's just kind of a really big responsibility, so... I have been watching you all night. Mm -hmm. It does not seem very hard. Hey, hey, I trained for hours and hours. There were rehearsals, and we spent so much time... Was... Did, did I hear that? Cuddles? Cuddles, is that you? Oh my god, I missed you so much! Uh, you might go for it, Habitat. I believe in you! And now... To present the finalists for Best Novel, Adam Savage of Earth. Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave to present the category for Best Novel. Okay, I have always built things from my earliest days as a young child messing around with model kits and the materials that I could find in my father's studio. I grew up and ended up using those skills in the service of special effects houses like ILM on films like The Matrix and Star Wars. I spent years building stuff only to blow it up on Mythbusters, and now I enjoy being part of a global maker community on Tested.com. I build things. The people in tonight's category, they build worlds. Think about this. Every single one of them has taken a discrete number of characters and sounds that make up language and use them to make the impossible possible, at least in our brains. They have poured their narratives into the minds of their readers, many of whom have not even been born yet. It's a little like telepathy, time travel, cultural psychology, and alchemy all rolled up into one. Now, while I build things, Everything that I have built began as an idea, an idea I could not stop paying attention to until I had to render it physically and learn what I could from it, learn how it could transform me. And stories are ideas that transform us. For the length of the story, we hand over the reins to an author who literally rejects our reality and substitutes their own. When it's over, they deposit us back into our world, back into ourselves. But with all the great stories, we're not quite the same. We and the world we live in feel just a little bit different. The six nominees tonight have shared with us stories of robots, magicians, avatars, and human beings that come from worlds that are very much like ours, and yet 
not like ours at all. The six nominees for Best Novel are Paranese by Susanna Clark, The City We Became by N.K. Jemison, Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia, The Midnight Bargain by C.L. Polk, Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse, and Network Effect by Martha Wells. Habitat doesn't have hands, so I still get to do this part. Hmm. And the nebula for best novel goes to... Network Effect by Martha Wells from Tor.com. Congratulations. Con Congratulations. Network Effect is the highly anticipated first novel from the Murderbot series, which follows an anxious and sarcastic sec unit as they try to save their former employers turned friends. Martha Wells has previously been nominated for Best Novel and won for Best Novella. This is her first win in this category. Hi, uh, I wasn't expecting that. Um, I already feel so privileged to be finalist this year, along with the other novels in this category. Um, are you sure you didn't make a mistake? Because this just feels really unreal at this point. Um, it's, it's a huge honor to win. Um, I want to say to all the writers who have been othered in some way because of who they are, especially those of you who are my age, that I hope that if things go wrong with your writing career, that you think seriously about just not giving up. There are people who don't want you to write. They especially don't want you to write and be published. They want all stories to be told by people him, or by people who think becoming an indentured servant in order to go to Mars is a great idea and not the gateway drug to the corporation rim. I know sometimes it's unavoidable because of health problems or other things you just can't do anything about. But if you feel you're being pushed out of this field and you don't want to be, I hope you, I hope you will continue to write and write your stories and tell your truth and push yourself back in because you never know what might happen if you keep trying. Thank you to everyone who voted for Network Effect. I would also like to thank my agent, Jennifer Jackson, uh, Michael Curry, and also my editor, Lee Harris, uh, publisher, Irene Gallo, and everyone else at Tor.com, my awesome audiobook narrator, Kevin R. Free, and everyone at Recorded Books, and cover artist, Jamie Jones, and cover designer, Christine Falzer. And thanks and love to my husband, Troy, and my friends who encouraged me and kept me going when stopping seemed like the better idea. Thank you so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Thank you. I've had clients who thought they needed an absurd level of security, and I'm talking absurd even by my standards, and my code was developed by a bond company known for intense xenophobic paranoia tempered only by desperate greed. I've also had clients who thought they didn't need any security at all, right up until something ate them. That's mostly a metaphor. My uneaten client stat is high. Congratulations again, Martha. Thank you for letting me be part of your story tonight, Adria. And thank you for being part of mine. Oh, thank you. It's been so nice getting to know you. Are you going to be here much longer? Does time even exist for you? Of course time exists for me. Stories do not exist without time. Soon I will continue my journey onwards. What will you do next? First, I'm going to go check in with Cuddles. And then everyone else can either step away from their screens or if you're part of the conference, the after party in the Hopkinson suite starts right now. And you're welcome to join that too, by the way, Habitat. Congratulations once again to all our winners and finalists, and thank you to the presenters and the incredible team of staffers and volunteers who made this ceremony and the Nebula Conference possible. Tonight was amazing, and it was all because of you. We have lived through a year that school kids will be writing papers about for decades, and we have all been changed by it. 
be good to yourselves and to each other. Next year, we may be doing this in person. Until then and after, the airship flies on. Good night, everyone.